It's time for Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Cougar Post Game Live is brought to you by Quick Quack Car Wash. Fast, clean, loved, everywhere. Also by Provo Land Title. Buying, selling, or refinancing? Close with the pros at Provo Land Title. Relax. PLT has you covered. And by First Colony Mortgage, your trusted lender for all your mortgage needs. Visit firstcolonymortgage.com. Now let's join your host, Jason Shepard. Eight to seven, BYU improves to two and zero oh with its second consecutive dominating performance. Forty-eight seven, they beat the Trojans of Troy. Welcome in to Cougar Post Game Live. Looking to get your reaction to tonight's victory. You can chime in on Twitter. Tweet at me at JSN Shep at JSN Shep. We'll get to uh, some of your tweets throughout Cougar Post Game Live. But before we go any further, I want to make sure that you know when BYU wins, you win with Papa John's Pizza. Use the online promo code BYU50, that's BYU50, at PapaJohns.com this coming Monday, and you're going to receive 50% off pizza. This offer is good at any Utah location Monday only. We'll obviously let you hear from some of the players and coaches. Uh, we are all monitoring the post-game Zoom press conference. Head coach Kalani Satake should be first. So uh, as soon as we see him and hear from him, uh, we will uh, we will put that through so that you can hear it as well. Uh, but a couple of things that I want to get to, and I mentioned obviously a dominating performance, and that was obvious to anybody that watched or listened or both to the game tonight. But it was a different type of domination completely different type of game than what we saw when BYU handed Navy the 55-3 to win in Week 1. And, and I want to just go over exactly what BYU did to Troy. Troy is a team, obviously, not coming from a power conference. This is a team, though, that does have a history of being able to come up big in big situations. And their offense is one that people regard have high regard for. Last week in their first game, Troy beat Middle Tennessee. And in that game, they won 47 to 14. Total yards in that game, 496 yards of offense for Troy last week. Tonight, BYU's defense held Troy to just 181 total yards from almost 500 to sub-200 in total yards. BYU's defense was dominating. And with the exception of one play, which went for 55 yards and ultimately led to the only touchdown that the Trojans would score, that's it. BYU's defense gave up one big play all night long. And they did that the majority of the evening rushing three. They were as dominant as you could possibly be in a situation like this. And certainly on the offensive side of the football for BYU, just looking at the numbers alone, it's eye-popping. As Greg was talking about just moments ago, 664 total yards of offense, 472 through the air, 192 on the ground. Zach Wilson, just an unbelievable evening for the BYU starting quarterback, 23 of 28, 392 yards, two touchdowns passing. He also rushed for two touchdowns, and all of those numbers were just through three quarters. He only played three quarters and had those types of of numbers. You look at the ground game, as I mentioned, 192 yards. Lopini Katoa was 76. He had 50 for Tyler Algier. Kavika, Kavika Fanua, who played defense most of the night, had seven carries for 27. Miles Davis for 20. Dax Milne rushed for 14. Uh, Mason Wake, how about him getting his first touchdown as a BYU Cougar finished with two? Had two rushing attempts for 11 yards and two touchdowns. You had Cody Epps, one for five. And as I mentioned, Zach Wilson with two rushing touchdowns. Not to mention what Zach Wilson did once again throwing to his receivers. Gunnar Romney, five catches, 138 yards, average uh, 27.6 per catch tonight. This is a guy that came into tonight leading the nation in yards per catch at 33 and a half. So he's just continuing 
to pick up and rack up massive yardage, and he has got a fantastic vibe right now with his quarterback. Let's not forget, though, Dax Milne, 140 yards on seven catches and a touchdown. Just a fantastic night all the way around. And at the end of the night, what matters is that BYU picked up the win. They are 2-0, and and once again, a national television audience saw BYU dominate an opponent. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll look at some other scores in college football. The last time we had a game, so three weeks ago, BYU is it. It's kind of nice that there are other college football games that were played today. We'll go over some of those scores, quite a few upsets, some big upsets, in fact. We'll get to that when we come back, and then also uh, let you hear from head coach Kalani Satake, hopefully when he joins the Zoom press conference for postgame. 48-7, your final score. BYU defeats Troy. We'll have more Cougar Post Game Live coming up after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. For anybody that wondered if BYU would be rusty at all after having played only one game in 20 days, uh, I think the answer to that was they were not rusty. 48-7 is the final score. BYU now 2-0 and as they beat the Trojans of Troy. Coming up on Friday, that will be BYU's next game because of conference weekend. Uh, BYU will play the game on Friday evening. Uh, Louisiana Tech will be the opponent, and that's actually where we'll start with some of our uh, scores from earlier today in college football. Louisiana Tech got the victory. They are now 2-0. They defeated Houston Baptist. Sort of a double-edged sword, I guess. Impressive that Louisiana Tech scored 66 points, but they gave up. 38 points to Houston Baptist but again at the end of the day they are 2-0 and and they will be in Provo coming up on Friday all right top 25 action number 12 Miami gets the win over their rival Florida State 52 to 10 is the final score for the 12th ranked Hurricanes number 20 Virginia Tech defeating NC State 45 to 24 number two Alabama flexed its muscles in Columbia Missouri tonight as they took down Mizzou 38 to 19 this is one of the uh, exciting games of the day probably not that exciting if you're a Sooners fan number three Oklahoma hosting Kansas State Oklahoma had a three-touchdown lead in the second half, so you're thinking the Sooners are going to cruise to a victory. Not so fast. K-State, once again, this is back-to-back years in which they have upset Oklahoma. They rally and win 38-35, to and they take down number three, Oklahoma, one of the upsets today. Not an upset. Number four, Georgia, winning at Arkansas 37-10 to was the final score. Fifth-ranked Florida, defeating Ole Miss 51 to 35. Number six, LSU at home hosting Mississippi State. Mike Leach making his debut with Mississippi State. And it's uh, it's all good for the Pirate. 44-34, they upset sixth-ranked LSU, the defending national champions. All right, a couple of other games for you. This matchup featuring two teams in the top 25. Number eight, Auburn, defeats number 23, Kentucky, 29 to 13. A final in overtime. Number eight, Texas, still not quite sure how this happened. They defeat Texas Tech, 63 to 56. Number 10, Texas A&M, very low scoring game. They defeat Vanderbilt, 17 to 12. Number 13, UCF, Central Florida, getting the win at Eastern Carolina. They won big, 51 to 28. In a game I watched the majority of, number 14, Cincinnati, taking on number 22, Army. Obviously, Army and BYU were scheduled to play last week. That game uh, was postponed. We'll see ultimately if it's canceled uh, as the season goes on. Uh, Army did not look great today. They they lost 24-10. to Bearcats get the win. Cincinnati didn't look great either. At least their offense didn't. Defense was pretty good. Uh, the defense actually ended up scoring a, a touchdown. Or excuse me, Army's defense scored a touchdown, which made the 10 points not even as uh, as impressive because the offense for the for the cadets only scored three points. So 24-10, it was Cincinnati defeating Army, Oklahoma State 15th in the country defeating West Virginia 27 to 13. Number 16 Tennessee gets the win at South Carolina 31 to 27, and number 19 Louisiana defeating Georgia Southern by 220 to 18. Uh, quickly checking to see if we're getting any action down on the postgame press conference. 
Let's uh, look and see. Does not appear as if Kalani Sataki is there yet. One other score, and then we'll take a quick break. Uh, number 21, Pitt, uh, defeating number 24, Louisville, 23-20. to 20. All right, let's uh, see if we can time this. We will take a quick timeout. Hopefully Kalani Sataki via Zoom on the other side. 48-7, your final. BYU 2-0, defeating Troy tonight at Lavelle Edwards Stadium in the home opener on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's rejoin Jason Shepard for more Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. BYU running away with the victory at Lavelle Edwards Stadium 48-7. Looks like head coach Kalani Satake is addressing the media via Zoom. Let's listen in. Thankful we got to play the game and got the win, you know, and really pleased with the way the guys played in all three phases. Obviously, there's some things that we could still improve on for next week. Looking forward to the matchup against Louisiana Tech. I thought uh, Troy did some really good things to test us, and but uh, I, I thought our you know, our team were able to respond and answer through some adversity. You know, we, we muffed the punt earlier, and I think it was Dax, I believe, that, that did it. And uh, I'm glad our coaches kept believing in him to, to – you know, have a presence in, in the game and, and get a continue to return our punts and also, you know, make a difference as a receiver on the field. So uh, re really pleased with the physical part of the game. I thought our guys were able to respond the right way on defense and, and on, on offense with uh, the, you know, we asked them to toughen up and play some tough football and put our guys in some compromising positions that would test their physical part of the game. And I thought they answered it the, well, the right way. So looking forward to the next game and improving from this one to the next. But uh, really pleased with the leadership and the guys on the field. So I'll take any questions you guys have. <coughs> Hey, Kalani, well, because of the nature of your schedule this year and the way the uh, the pollsters vote, do you feel any pressure at all to, to get style points, as it were? Obviously, you haven't against Navy and again tonight, but does that thought ever enter your mind? No, I just want to win games and, and uh, you know, play with sportsmanship and, and, and do things the right way. I, I, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, it doesn't look good for the stats that, that our red zone offense, you know, we, we've had to kneel down the, the ball twice now, and it's okay. I, I like being in those – I like being in, in a situation where I have to make those decisions, you know, but uh, I don't believe in style points. I believe in just winning the game and, and establishing a, a, an identity that we want to get done for that game. And I felt like we've done it the last two weeks. Uh, obviously, looking forward to the matchup with Louisiana Tech, but yeah, I just feel like <clears throat> this is the right thing to do, and and uh, you know we we did some great things. The other 59 minutes were full of our our team playing the right way, and 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 uh, look at those minutes for the style points. I I know people look at the scoreboard and things like that, and that's okay. I, I feel like we were able to play our style of football and, and represent the right way. Kalani, how satisfying is it for you to get a, a win, a 41-point win in a game where you had to dig into your depth and you had to overcome some adversity with personnel and navigating this this pandemic and as far as personnel goes? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I think that, you know, looking at the coaches and the staff, I, I, I thought they prepared, prepared really well. And then they, they, you know, looking at the practices, the things that we've had to do since we, you know, had to postpone the Army game, I was really, really happy with the way the coaches worked with the, with the players. And, you know, we, we had another uh, another small group of players that joined us on on Thursday. And so we didn't have a lot of time with them and wanted to just monitor their the physical part if they're in condition and, and good enough to play in the game. And um, we, we knew that we were going to have to use a, a good number of different players. And uh, we wanted to get the scheme right, that make sure our guys are going to play, you know, assignment sound football and, and, and on offense, defense, and special teams. So I was really pleased with the way the guys prepped. Um, you know, this is that's just kind of what you have to deal with when you're when you're going through the the pandemic. You know, we're dealing with COVID, and and so we're, we're going to have to keep continue to do that every week and, and monitor our guys, but uh, also know that there's a chance that some guys might not be able to play, and we might have to uh, check out the depth. And, and we've done a lot of cross training with our guys, and, and luckily it's helping us out, especially in, in the game tonight. Kalani, you touched on this, but I wanted to ask about that sequence after the muffed punt for the defense to go out and force a turnover on downs and thus be able to kind of set the tone for the game and not let Troy get any momentum off of off of the turnover. 
Yeah, I mean, the guys, it helps having great leaders on the team, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, after we forced the punt, uh, the, I love the way the defense responded to the fact that they had to get back on the field and go. And they sprinted on the field and were excited to play again. And, and uh, you know, <clears throat> regardless of, of what happens in the next series, you have a great chance if your guys are fired up, ready to go. And and, and there was more like just having um, Dax's back in that in that situation. I believe it was Dax. Was it Dax that muffed that? <clears throat> yeah, so it was like just the players supporting their teammates and showing them love and, and, and you know, having his back and getting out there and doing it. And, and look what it did for Dax the rest of the night, you know what I mean? So uh, I'm just thankful that I have great leadership on the team, great coaches that, that prep their guys well, and and, and, and uh, looking forward to keeping it going with these guys. I, I thought, you know, they're, we were tested at, at times, and we knew what we were trying to get established on defensive side and offense, and I felt like we did that. We got, got it done. And, Still disappointed about giving up the, that big play uh, at the end of the first half like, to give up points. But I love how the offense is Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of things. Things that you look on the on the film and tonight I'll, I'll be able to watch it. But I feel like we have some big plays that we left out. There's some sacks that we could have got and. And definitely some interceptions. We had our hand on the ball, and I thought we made some great reads. We just got to come down with those. Turnovers will be big for us, and, and hopefully you know, we can improve on that next week. Questions from Jake Hatch and then Sean Walker. Lonnie, you've seen a lot of your guys get action in these games because you've been up so big so early in them. How beneficial is it to get them live reps in games? Yeah, it's been huge for us. I mean, uh, that's you know, and it, but we're also a deep team. We have a lot of guys that have played a lot of a lot of minutes on the field uh, that that are giving us really quality depth. You know, so um, I think that's the key. We've 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 been in the situation where injuries have forced us to play a lot of different guys. Uh, maybe maybe without them having a lot of experience, but now we have depth where there's a lot of experience and guys can get on the field. And it's not like a you know, we're not missing that. It's not a huge drop off from one to two right now, and and uh, hopefully we can keep that going. And we'd like to see not that be be a huge drop off from two to three, and and hopefully we don't get there with some of the with some of the issues. But we may have to get there if, if you know guys test positive and we have to quarantine and things like that. And that's just a different. That's just that adds more stress and anxiety to the whole mix. That you you know we're gonna test again and and make sure that. You know, we have to see what the results are. That that I feel, you know, it's it's, it's a tough, stressful situation when you're testing and waiting for the results. But um, I thought our guys handled it like champs, and I'm just, I just like the way our guys play tonight. There's a lot of energy, and you can feel it from the sideline, you know. And um, just, uh, I I love the way that they respond to the fact that no fans are gonna. That was a little bit of a downer, you know, for a lot of the guys that no fans are gonna be here and. Um, the players are talking about, you know, governor's announcement and support of the team, and they understand it. You know, I just wanted to, I, I like the way that this team governs itself and the players um, are there to help support and communicate with each other. They, it's making my job a lot easier as a head coach. Hey, coach, you talked about how, coach, you talked about how big it was for the guys to have Dax's back after that muffed punt. What about the way that he responded to that muff punt coming back 140 yards, had that really nice long touchdown run? Is that just something that that just speaks to his maturity and kind of growth in this game that he can have that short memory and put it aside and, and have a, one of the best games of his career? Definitely. You know, that this, this, this game is um, it's a lot of mistakes that could happen. We talked about it as a team that we're going to we're going to face some adversity. We went for it on fourth down quite often. You know what I mean? And and um, that, that's just what we're going to do. I think they stuffed us, a, you know, a couple of times and, and a de defense had to respond. But these guys have each other's back and, and they love each other. They, they love playing for each other. They love playing for their families and for the fans. And so, um you know, that, we knew Dax was going to be fine. I, I think the, he was excited to get back out there and, and, and get the next punt, you know. So, um, yeah, just love the way the guys play. I, I thought I thought the offense did, did a great job pro protecting the football the rest of the night, you know, and, and um, 
you have to give Troy credit that they're, they're, they're a good team. They have a lot of speed, a lot of athleticism on that team. And I felt like our um, offense and defense were able to take that speed and minimize it a little bit and, and show, also show that we have some speed too. You know, I, I, We keep talking about other people and their athleticism and speed, but I saw a lot of receivers making big plays and running by guys. And I saw you know, our defense running down guys too. So, um, you know, we'll have to keep proving it, and this is just another one game. And looking forward to improving on the next one, and and uh, our guys have a lot to prove. So we'll get some of the things fixed and uh, make sure that we get get better next week. A few more questions from Jared Lloyd and Mitch Harper. Lonnie, well, the defensive effort. You give up 149 yards in game one, 181 tonight. That's got to be pretty pleasing for someone with your defensive background, just to see the the defense, the way that it stood tall in these first two games and, and made plays no matter who was on the field. Yeah, and I, I thought that the presence up front was felt. That's that's what we wanted on both sides of the ball, you know, on defense and offensive line. We, we want those big guys to lead the way. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like we were able to do some things in the past game because of uh, – you know, we establish a run game and be physical up front. And then on defense, I thought we, we handled the run really well with, with the front. I think Kyrus and the boys were ready to roll, you know, and, and um, just I, I like the way our team responded. I like the way they answered the call to be physical and tough. And, you know, let's, let's find some more consistency and do it again for the third week. You know, this is a different beast that we're going to face with Louisiana Tech, but <clears throat> I think our guys are ready for it. And I just, it really helps having a bunch of veteran guys on the team and guys that I say veteran, but it's like a lot of, a lot of older guys that have, have played and some of them are still sophomores and juniors, but they've been, they've been in this situation of playing a lot of minutes, you know, and, and you just got a good feel from these guys. I just love the way our team is working together and, and the, the way they respond to a lot of different things, including the pandemic, you know, and things that we asking them to do. And, you know, this, I thought we've, we've been handling the testing and, and the pandemic really well and looking forward to keep improving so we can keep playing this game. Kalani, Zach's throws to a career high 392 tonight. What's led to this point in, in Zach's career where he's made this big leap forward as a quarterback? I think Zach's leadership is, is starting to show. And, and I mentioned this um, last game that, you know, this is, he had a great off season, you know, before he'd had to, you know, he, he had to kind of nurse some injuries and get back from it. Right. And this is the first time that he had a great off season, being able to just take care of his stuff and perfect this craft. He's throwing the ball really well. He's seeing things really well, making the, be the, the, the right checks, you know, and putting the guys in the right spot. And, and, and there's a lot of still room for improvement, you know, and, I know that Zach will think that that this isn't a great, the, the good enough. Uh, there's some things that I know that he, there's some plays I know he wish he could he could have back. But man, I, I just like the way he's working. I like the way he's leading this team. You know, he's he's played a lot of a lot of games for us, a lot of minutes, and the guys look to him as a leader. And I, I like the way he and Baylor and Jaron, that whole quarterback room, is working. So uh, we'll keep we'll keep flowing with him. And I think his leadership is is uh, he still feel a lot more comfortable being a leader. Um, now being here for so long, you know, it's been a lot. Yeah, it's been a long time. I mean, he's played a lot of games. So, but the improvement that I, this is the stuff that you won't be able to see is that the things that he did during the off season on a personal level to improve his game is starting to really show. So, and, and he's not the only one. There's a lot of guys on our team that, you know, really improve their skills and, and, and be able to perfect their craft a little bit more. So that helps out having a bunch of guys that are intrinsically motivated and, 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 um, you know, guys that I can trust. Okay. Thank you, coach. All right, guys. Stay safe. Appreciate it. I believe Zach Wilson is coming up next. All right. That was uh, head coach Kalani Satake. And uh, as you may have just heard, Zach Wilson uh, will be joining the media momentarily after BYU gets the win 48 to seven. They are now two and O back in action coming up on Friday against Louisiana tech. The quarterback coming off a career night, Zach Wilson. Now at the microphone, let's listen in. Hey, Jared, we'll take uh, – Zach, welcome. Uh, we'll start with a question from Jared Lloyd. Hey, Zach, nice game tonight. I wanted to ask about starting, being able to – you know, you, you look forward to coming out on the field and then there's a muffed punt. How big was it to take the field after your defense got a stop after that turnover? <clears throat> what did that do for the momentum and just setting the tone for the game? Yeah, I would say the guys handled it well. You know, 
um, you know, personally, me in that situation, saw the muff punt, you know, honestly just shook it off. It was like no big deal. You know, guys make mistakes. Dax will tell you that firsthand, right? How many how many teams muff a punt in a season happens all the time. So, you know, it was no big deal for us. We knew we were going to come back. We knew the defense had our back. They were going to get a stop, and we we're going to come back out and, and uh, be able to put a drive together. Okay, uh, we'll take a question from uh, Mitch Harper and then Jake Catch. Zach, how big of a relief is it to have this dominant performance once again after multiple weeks of uncertainty with personnel and postponements? Just how big of a relief was it to have this type of performance once again? Yeah, you know, it's been it's been great for the team. You know, we had three weeks off. I feel like everyone handled it well. They they handled what they were supposed to over those three weeks. They knew we have something special in, in this team, and, and they put in the work those three weeks. And, you know, I'm just happy that that all the work this whole team's put on in, in the offseason is finally showing. Okay, Jake Hatch. Zach, you put up a career high in passing yards. This offense is rolling early on the season. What's been the key to you guys having such success? You know, playmakers, I'd say we're, we're very versatile. We got great running backs, you know, dudes making, uh, you know, big time plays, making guys miss. And then, you know, at the same time, you know, I can throw a swing route to a back. I can throw a, an arrow to a receiver and those guys are going to make guys miss and they're going to go make big time plays down the field. And, um, you know, really, I, I just think we have that playmaking ability where guys aren't letting the first one take them down. Okay, Jared Lloyd, we'll take another question from you. Zach, in two games, you guys have put up over 100 points now. What does that mean to be able to come out and, and just show what this offense is capable of and, and, you know, try and, I don't know, get the attention that you can get in a season like this with these types of performances? Yeah, all it means is we can't get too, uh, too big of an ego, too big of a big head going into the next week. And, you know, we're a good offense, but it means nothing if we just stop it now, you know. So we got we to gotta keep getting after a practice, um, prepare for our next opponent. You know, LaTeX a great team, and uh, we got to come out ready to play against those guys. So really, you know, all it means is, um, you know, we're just one more step there to where we got to be. Sean Walker will take your next question next. Yeah, Zach, you had a great game throwing the ball for the quarterback. I mean, you know as well as anybody, a quarterback's only as good as re as his receivers. Did guys like Gunner and Dax and them kind of make it quote unquote easy tonight? I guess. Yeah, you know the whole everyone around Gunner, Dax, Neil, uh, Isaac. You even have the fullbacks Mason and and then Peeney and Tyler. I'm throwing the ball to them on on the on the edges too. And um, you know, as a quarterback, I can honestly say that. You know, a quarterback is always as good as the guys around him, and I'm fortunate to have a, a great, you know, 10 guys that rally around me, and, um, you know, I can make the easy play, and they can make it a big play. Okay, Darnell Dixon. Zach, can you describe the feeling and the, the, what the experience was like playing in an empty stadium tonight? You know, as a player, personally, you know, there's a couple times maybe when the defense is on or, or you know, we're jogging at halftime or, or, you know, a big play happens, you don't hear any fan noise. Um, that you actually notice it, you know, but when you're so dialed in on, on what's going on and, and you're, you know, you're focused on, you know, the defensive front, what, you know, maybe what pressure could be coming, you know, the play, what motion, you know, all that kind of stuff, it, you know, it's, you don't even notice it. You know, that's one of the biggest things I've noticed. And I'm sure a lot of the guys could say the same thing is you really don't even notice the crowd not being there. Hey, uh, Jay Drew, your question. Yeah. Hey, Zach, uh, I'm just curious if you found a different place to live. Seems like all of Provo uh, wants to know. Uh, you know, it's hard. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, you know, I got another week, but I definitely have some options. So. Hey, uh, Brandon Gurney, <coughs> and uh, I think that's it. Brandon? Yeah, a game like this, Zach, a lot of uh, new faces were able to make plays, some by necessity, some – uh, just by the course of the game. How nice is it for you as a, as a leader on this team to see some of those guys step up and make plays and have that opportunity? You know, it's huge. I'd say that's the, the biggest advantage of having a, a team full of experienced guys is, you know, this is the first time I felt like, you know, not just me, but the entire line, the receiving core, the tight ends are, are, are filling in their role of, you know, being able to take everything to the next level. You know, there's plays that we've made tonight that, you know, that we probably weren't doing last year or the year before. And, and I just think that's an experience thing. And guys are out here making plays. Okay, any other questions for Zach? Okay, thank you.
All right, that's BYU quarterback Zach Wilson, a career night for B- for BYU's QB. 392 yards, two touchdowns through the air, two on the ground, a dominating performance by the Cougars. They win 48-7. to That's going to do it for Cougar Post Game Live. The Cougar Locker Room Show is next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Welcome back to post-game coverage of BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Our coverage continues with the Cougar Locker Room Show, brought to you by Utah Community Credit Union. Get more house, same payment at UCCU. It's what we do. Let's head live to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth and join Riley Nelson, along with the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. And then Jared Lloyd. Brandon, you're not, you're muted. Dang it, I did that again. Okay. <laughs> uh, course of the game, we're able to see a lot of new faces make plays, specifically for your skill <clears throat> position group, Miles Davis. How nice is it for you as a team leader to see some of those guys get that opportunity and to step up when that opportunity comes their way? Oh, I love it. I, I get so excited on the sideline when I see, um, you know, guys who, who, you know, are not as confident with, the game, just because of a lack of reps, to make plays like that, it's such a confidence booster for him, and, and he deserves it. He's been working hard. And so and I was celebrating. I was probably celebrating more than anybody when he, you know, made his, his great runs that he, he was doing. Uh, Jared Lloyd? AD, you guys have gone up against this defense throughout <laughs> camp, and, and you know just how good it is. What's it like seeing them have the success they're having at shutting teams down? I mean, you guys took a little bit to get going in the game tonight, and and they just were shutting Troy down, except for maybe the one big play. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Like we knew it was gonna happen. Like the the competition all fall camp, you know, just knowing how good they were, I was just like, good luck, basically, to the other teams. Like good luck trying to score on them because they got talent you know, all across the board. Any other questions from uh, Lapini? Uh, Jake Catch. Lapini, of course, you guys have a game on Friday, so it's a day sooner than what you normally would have. What's the key to getting ready on a short week? Uh, really just just lock in and maybe a day earlier. You know, we might lose a day of uh, film preparation that we might not have, um, you know, but just – getting our, our minds focused on the next opponent a little sooner. I, I don't think it will be too big of a problem, though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was running back Lopini Katoa. We will take a break. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show, BYU 48 and Troy 7, our final score. You're listening to postgame coverage on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU 48, Troy 7, our final score. Kyrus Tonga, two sacks and a pass breakup on a stat line tonight. Kyrus is meeting with the media via Zoom right now. Let's join in. Yeah, Darnell and then Brandon and then Sean Walker. Yeah, Kairos, can you describe the experience of playing in an empty stadium? I know the last game against Navy, there were some fans there, but... What was that experience like for you and your teammates? Um, it's fun. Um, we're just grateful to even to even play and have this opportunity. But uh, we definitely miss the fans, and um, we know that they're watching, and so we're grateful for them, and um, we just can't wait to, to see you guys out there. Yeah, Kyrus, the defensive line really stood out again. You guys are getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. We all knew how good you were coming into the season. How good are you? Are these guys stepping up? Like, like, uh, uh, you're back. But I'm forgetting his name name right now. But uh, uh, just some of the other guys, we could just give a shout out to them. And, and what are they doing to maybe help you in that regard? Uh, our D line has been working super hard this whole off season, and uh, they're just grateful to even to get the time. As soon as um, the numbers are called, they're uh, giving a hundred percent effort. So grateful for for guys who. Who come and play if it's a uh, one snap or 90 snaps whatever they can get they'll they'll give 100 percent of effort so grateful for the d-line and and all they do in their hard work 
speaking with the Zoom contingent because we have live with us on headset Dax Milne. Dax 7 grabs 140 and a score career night for Dax. And Dax, we believe, is on headset with us from down near the Cougar locker room. Dax, can you hear us okay? Yep, loud and clear. I'm here. Hey, fantastic. And I know you were, you've been waiting a little bit, so I, I, I thank you for your patience as we try and get through all of this on post game. So thanks for sticking around with us. Of course. Okay, so uh, Dax, I think your first touch tonight comes on the punt return. Is that right? Yep. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a great touch, but uh, yeah, what happened happened, and um, had to just find a way to bounce back. I, I just had a a ton to say about my teammates that rallied behind me and and told me that every, everything was all good and don't worry about it. And and the defense um, got my back and just got a stop right after that. So it just says a lot about the defense and and the kind of guys we have. It's a tough way to start a night for you personally, but then you see immediately a team get the ball in great scoring position, get nothing out of it. That has to boost your spirits. And then as Riley Nelson noted on the air tonight, I, what was it? The, Riley, was it the next play that went right to Dax? Was it? Yeah, it, it was. I apologize. My mic wasn't on there. Dax, the very first play, uh, you ran that comeback, and Zach found you up. I, as a quarterback, I know when I have playmakers – Whenever they, you know, look, those physical type of mistakes happen, right? And so you you want to try and get the ball back in their hands. My question for you is, all week long, was that play kind of designed to go to that comeback, or did Zach look you up, try and get you in the in your hands? Obviously, you made a great catch on the sideline for 17 yards on the very first offensive play of the game. Yeah, yeah, we've been running that play th- throughout practice all week, and and Zach, I was glad Zach uh, came came to me because you know I kind of needed a. You know the ball to get my get my head up and and so he made a great throw and I was it was fortunate enough to get 17 yards out of it. And then every other punt return, you were back doing what you normally do. Uh, was there any kind of conversation with you and Coach Lamb after that first play, or is it just like did he not not even need to bring it up? Um, no, yeah, he just kind of uh, lifted me up and just just uh, made sure I was I was all right mentally and and he he had all the confidence in the world um, for me to just go out there and. And do what I do, uh, do what I've done a million times. So it was good. You were off and running, and by the end of the night, you're looking at seven for 140. Uh, your, your previous high uh, in receiving yards was, I think, in the 60s. Uh, so this night was, you know, a, a huge leap from where you had been. Um, but I, I don't know that you or Gunner or anybody else who's playing well says this is beyond your expectations. This is what you think you guys are capable of, right? Uh, of course, yeah, we've. We know we've known what we can do, and we've done it in practice, and and it's just fortunate enough to get some balls our way all night. I, it was honestly surprising after I I saw the stats. I just uh, during the game I wasn't really keeping track, and then I saw after I was like, oh wow. So, so Dax on your seventy yarder, the the formation was into the boundary, and the play action was into the boundary. You were kind of up on an island up top, so the camera. I mean, obviously, and I, I was you know got caught falling the ball a little bit. So I didn't see what move you put on that cornerback. How did you get so wide open? Did you stutter the guy? Did you make him fall down? T- talk to us through that 70-yarder that start kicked off the second half. Uh, yeah, the, the route was a, a slant and go, and so he he had heavy eyes on on me, and, and as soon as I broke in out on the slant, he he bit really hard, and it was just easy enough to um, slip right by him. And, and Zach made sure that he didn't overthrow me, which was smart because those are the worst if you just overthrow those kind of plays. And so I was able to make a miss after, and and it was a great play by everyone. How good has Zach been through two games? Oh, he's been amazing. I, uh, but I, it's nothing. It's not a surprise to me. I know how not, know how hard he he's worked in the off season, and and so it's it's no surprise. You guys have played eight quarters so far, Dax. You've scored points in every quarter. And um, th- this just feels like uh, uh, the kind of offense that, that in, in three years under Jeff Grimes now is, is really starting to, to click and, and, and be in sync. How do you describe the way this team has played offensively through two games? Uh, yeah, it's been really satisfying to be able to actually put points on the board. I mean, in past years, we've been able to move the ball great. But um, I think our issue has always kind of been actually uh converting some red zone, red zone um plays and so it's it's awesome to see us scoring in uh, every quarter like you said and and ultimately getting those uh younger guys in the game i love to see it and now the only time you guys don't score in the red zone is when you're kneeling down to end the game <laughs> exactly that's that's the way you want it right <laughs> that's what you want to do yeah. hey dax really quick you mentioned the overthrow that you were lucky you were glad that zach didn't overthrow you neil 
had, I think, the only overthrow of the night. How much flack is he going to get in the receiver room on Monday for missing his chance at throwing a touchdown? Hey, listen, he's already caught a lot of flack. Me and him uh, <laughs> throughout the week, I, I wanted to, I wanted to be the one that threw that threw that one, but um, he ended up getting it, so he's not going to hear the end of it from me. I'll tell hey, you he's going to tell you that, look, he wasn't that open. He probably wouldn't have scored. The reality was, who was, who was down on the route? Was it uh, Wake? Or it was no? Rex. So it was Rex. Rex. Yeah, no, it was Isaac. That's right. It, Isaac had a step on the dude. He maybe would have caught him, but still, you can't let uh, Neil have even an inch on that. The reality <laughs> was he had his shot at glory, and he missed it. Exactly. He can't, he comes in the locker room talking about how only uh, Patrick Mahomes could have made that throw. But <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> Dax, good to be with you. Congrats on tonight. I hey, appreciate you guys. Thank you. All right, more of the Cougar Locker Room Show next here on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, so BYU had the ball for almost a half hour longer than the Troy Trojans tonight. A new Satake era high in possession time, 44-12 off the clock. Of course, it's not just the time you have with the ball. It's what you do with it, and BYU scored a lot of points with it. 48-7 to is our final score. BYU goes to 2-0, and the number 18 team in the country, uh, with 103 points through two games. We're talking about it, and we'll do so more with the coach, the Cougars, Kalani Satake, coming up next here on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Cougar Locker Room Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, it had been uh, seven years since BYU threw for this many passing yards against an FBS team in a game. 472 through the air tonight. Total of 664 is a Sitake era high and uh, the most in many years as well. Coach Kalani Sitake is joining us now on the headset from the Cougar locker room area. His team defeated Troy tonight by a score of 48-7. to Kalani, congratulations. Thanks, guys. That was a fun game. You know, I'm just proud of the players and uh, looking forward to building on this film and getting better for next week. For You know, for two games in, realizing one was spaced out 19 days from the other, you have to be really pleased with the level of sharpness your guys have shown. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a huge compliment to the leadership on this team, you know, and, and you know, we've been in, in, these guys have been in games where they weren't consistent, coming off of big wins, and so I think these guys, it's the experience of having guys that have been through it and leading the way and, and, and speaking to the team. I mean, they, they do some, um, th- this group is different, you know, and, and uh I think the veteran and the experience part of it is, is what's, what's key now. We're seeing these guys really lead and and uh, really work with each other. I've, I mean, I was just talking to Dax, you know, before he left, and just how much love he has for the defensive players. I mean, he muffed a punt, and the defense were cheering, get ready to get back on the field. It gave him a lot of confidence, and that's nothing that I'm doing. That's something that, that this leadership in the in the team, the camaraderie and the love that they have for each other and um, getting each other's back, you know, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. You guys, you know... Th- this is a team sport, the ultimate team sport, and that's just something that's a beautiful moment to see as a coach when, when guys feel that support from their teammates. Coach, you've been doing, you've been coaching for a long time. You, it's interesting. You said this; these guys are different, but the reality is, it, it's really the same kind of core guys that we've been seeing for sure the last two years, and a lot of them the last three years. So I think maturity is is a key thing. So speak a little bit. What is the what are the markers of a mature player and then a mature team? Because to me, that is the biggest difference between the, this core that's been largely the same from last year to this. Is they seem to have taken a large step. Is it the way they handle practice? Is it the way they handle adversity? The way they approach a game? What is really those signs of maturity? It's it, it's all of those things. You know, if you if you're thinking about like. Um sometimes you have to you, you go through some crap and, and and these guys learn tough lessons from it you know and um you know it's just that saying that that tough times don't last tough people do and we have some guys that have fought through some adversity and 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 in their personal lives and in their you know football and athletic um careers here at BYU and I think the, the key is just them keep leading and power their way through it and not focus on the mistakes. I think uh, attacking everything with optimism and positivity is a key for us, and I've been really pleased with them. Now, 
it helps to have we kept think, say, saying in the years past like man one day these guys are going to be veterans and it's going to be a huge difference and what we need to do is get get a, a thing you know with our team so it's it's a uh, rotating a bunch of a good core of of quality veterans in the group and then bringing in some new guys and then having them adapt to it that's the culture that we're starting to see now where the players a player-led team is starting to really hold each other accountable and they're starting to do things for each other uh, it means a lot more than than a coach doing it you know and and, and i think that once that thing gets rolling and the culture starts thriving i think that's going to be a beautiful moment i feel like we're starting to get there it, it took some time to, to happen and had some bumps along the way and it's just two games right now but i think the key of staying humble and hungry is going to be really important for us and and we can do that when when our guys are holding each other accountable and leading the way so uh, i give a lot of credit to our players the way that they're raised the the the, the the resiliency that they have, and then looking forward to seeing them, uh, you know, take it to this next game in, in, in week three for us. Visiting with Coach Kalani Sitake. More with the coach is next as we take a break. BYU 48 and Troy 7 tonight's final score on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Postgame coverage of BYU football continues with the Cougar Postgame Coaches Show. Brought to you by Mountain America Credit Union. Mountain America, guiding members forward for more than 80 years. Let's rejoin the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. It is time for the Mountain America Field Goal Recap. For each field goal BYU makes this season, Mountain America Credit Union donates $250 to the American Red Cross. Today, the Cougars made two more field goals for a running total of four on the season bringing the donation total to $1,000. And head coach Kalani Sitake, Jake Oldroyd, hit another one from 54. So that's back-to-back seasons in which he hits from 54. That's the second longest field goal in BYU history. And we were talking off the air about how good that field goal might have been good from. Yeah, and he's he's got a strong leg. I, I think he's improved his leg strength from last year to this year, but even more, you know, and, and, and you saw it on that kick. And I think the ball hit the net, and, and, and he knew he got a hold of it, and, I'm just glad. I mean, I didn't like the fact that we went backwards, you know, but I, I knew that um, with his leg we, we, we could call on him to kick field goals if we needed it. And I think there was times we went forward on fourth down a little bit uh, more than, than we anticipated, but um, I knew he would be ready to get in there and kick field goals if we needed him to. Through two games, Coach, you've played two very different styles of offense, but the defense has been disruptive in both games. Through two games, you have 14 TFLs, including nine sacks, and you also have 10 pass breakups. Yeah, I think this game was a little bit different for us. We knew that the, that um, especially what Troy was able to do against Middle Tennessee last week, we knew the, um, some of the athleticism and speed they have on their team, and we knew that we would have to change things up defensively. And I think we, we feel really comfortable with our guys in, in certain situations. Um, they played well, but I, I was really more pleased with how how tough they played up front with the D line, and then you know the way our guys tackled. I, th- I thought they came to balance and, and leveraged the play really well and stayed in their lanes, and uh, didn't give up big plays. I I'm really disappointed about that one pass. I felt like that has my fault. You know, we put our guys in a bad spot, and we took a timeout. We knew that okay, we could take advantage of it and try to get the ball back, and didn't know that it was going to cost us seven points and. So we'll, we'll try to improve that. I'll try to do better as a, as a head coach. Coach, this unit's playing extremely well together, and uh, you talked about it in your press conference about depth being tested and, and uh, things like that. And maybe you don't have an injury report or whatever, but uh, saw we were able to see Tyler Algier had a, you know some ice on his knee. I think he probably took a shot there. Kyrus, you know, ran, went back to the locker room for a minute, but it seemed, I mean, that we didn't stop the game for anybody. The training staff didn't really have to, with the exception of Hayden Livingston, which pretty obvious he took a knee to the helmet, so, uh, you know, he'll go into that protocol. But outside of Hayden, it may be some bumps and bruises, but uh, is it safe to say this uh, crew will be ready for next Friday from an injury standpoint? Yeah, and it'll be a quick turnaround because we're playing on Friday, you know, and so we we'll have to be mindful of, of, of their bodies on Monday. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, these guys will get treatment tomorrow. and, and But I, I think the the most important thing is that, you know, Kyrus came back and played, and um, Tyler could have gone back. I, I thought we made a, a decision just to hold him out, knowing that the game was probably out of reach at that, at that time. So I think the, for the most part, the guys are all going to be ready to roll. And you're right, Hayden, 
it's unfortunate, you know, because he was going to play a lot on defense as well. But, <clears throat> um, you know, we'll, we'll have to go with that. And, and the key is keeping our guys safe and, and, and making sure that they're when they return that they're they're ready for it. But overall, I think the defense and offense and special teams stayed pretty much uh, healthy and looking forward to being as much as full strength as we can. The, the biggest the biggest disruptor in our in our health is is the the COVID testing. So we'll, we'll just have to adjust and. You know, we will have to play with certain guys and, and, and make it work. I mean, as long as we have enough to fill the team on the, on the field, we're going to try to play as much as possible. You mentioned the word disruption, Kalani. Before the break, we'll ask you about the fact that you had to alter a lot of your prep between the last game and this game, and you guys got through it and managed to, again, look um, you know very sharp on what you wanted to do. Yeah, and, and again, I, I lean on the fact that our coaches worked hard. I mean, I, I love what... Uh, our coordinators have done organizing the team, you know, in, in, in all three phases. And, and our assistant coaches have done an amazing job. And you can see in the way the guys, it's the little things that, that matter the most. And and that, that goes to coaching. The guys demanding it out of their players, receivers blocking downfield, creating big plays, everybody doing the little things, you know. And, and I think uh, some of the things that we talk about is ball security, taking care of for the ball. Making good decisions, I uh, you know throwing the ball, but then as as well when we're when we're catching the ball and running, um, being mindful that that ball belongs to the program and to the fans and, and Cougar Nation. All right, one final segment with Coach Kalani Sitake is coming up next. BYU defeats Troy by a score of forty-eight to seven. Closing comments from the coach after this on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. You're listening to the Cougar Post Game Coaches Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, so welcome back to Lavelle Edwards Stadium. No fans in the stands tonight. Uh, same situation for Friday against La Tech. We'll see what happens for games beyond that. But uh, the, the things that happen between the lines are very pleasing to Cougar Nation as the Cougars win it by a score of 48-7. to Head coach Kalani Sitake with his last few moments with us. Greg Grubel and Riley Nelson up here in the booth with the coach. And, man, Zach Wilson, uh, back-to-back games to start his junior year. Kalani, over 200 in pass efficiency rating in both games. He's the first guy since Max Hall in 2008 to have consecutive games with a pass efficiency rating of 200 or better. Um, he's been very, very good to begin his third season. Uh, and, and tonight, you know, five incompletions, almost 400 yards passing, no picks. He's just been really, really good to start his junior year. He has been, and, and he's worked really hard on the offseason. I said that in, in post game, you know, and I think that, um, you know, a- a- A-Rod's done a great job prepping them. And, and I also think having competition that we had with Jaron and Baylor, those guys were ready to roll and then, and, and, it made them all better. All, all this stuff that's going on, the competition, the, the 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 brotherhood that they have with that with that that position group, um, you know, it, it's setting the example for everybody else. And I, I've been really really happy with the decisions he's making. There's there's a lot of plays that I wish I know he wish he could have back, and we just gotta get better. Uh, I think the key is for Zach, just like the rest of the team, stay humble and stay hungry, and, and don't ever be just pleased with what's going on. We gotta keep getting better. Staying on the offensive side of the ball, but switching position groups, we saw Kavika get some carries, and I got to admit, Coach, I was like, hey, man, we need some depth on the defense, so stop trying to punish everybody uh, that you see in a white (laughs) uniform. But, no, uh, physical running style. And then Miles Davis, man, I like as for a freshman out there, I was impressed and talking about, you know, it's great to have a two-way player in Kavika, but also knowing how important he is to the depth on the defensive side. Did Miles, you know, show well enough to maybe work his way into into that third spot to replace Jackson? Well, we think you know Miles, being a true freshman, stepped in, and made some really good plays, great vision. Uh, we knew that he could do things like that for us, you know, and and, and I think that uh, seeing him get on the field, I, I mean, Kavika still gives us that veteran and experienced guy guy in the backfield. Um, you know, we, we knew that Lopini and, and Tyler could handle the, the, the bulk of the carries, but it's just good having Kavika in there with not, not a lot of reps just to be able to go and, and you know, freshen up and be good at, at, at uh, running back, but then give us valuable reps on, on defense as well. And you're right, Miles is coming along. We, we have a, a, a good group of players still, and Harvey coaches them really well, you know, and it helps having a big physical line that, that helps block for them. So, uh, Chase Wester is a guy that we feel a lot of confidence with as well. So 
But we'll see how this thing rolls. And I think the key is now is just depending on test results, depending on, on guys being banged up, we'll, we'll see where we need to go with our depth. The schedule for this next week, uh, Kalani, with a Friday night game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a short turnaround, right? Like, the good thing is that, that um, you know, LaTeX coming here, so that's good that they're coming to Pro Bowl. But uh, we'll have to be, you know, mon mon we'll have some Monday slash Tuesday practice, Tuesday slash Wednesday, and then get that 48-hour rolling by the time we get to the, you know, Wednesday's practice before the game on Friday. Well, a good health to you and to your guys as you get ready for this quick turnaround and try to keep this thing rolling. But a tremendous start to the season and now the home season. And maybe one last word from you about uh, Cougar Nation, your thoughts for them as you don't get to see them personally and greet them here in, in your home venue. But hopefully those days are ahead. Well, I mean, uh, if if we need to start having fans here so that they can they can get on TV because I hear our, our sidelines going viral and it's probably not the most uh, <laughs> the most appropriate dancing, but uh, that's what happens when we don't have enough uh, fans here. But, you know, our, our players love our fans. We love Cougar Nation. Uh, can't wait to get them back out here. Let's make the, the best decisions and do the right thing so that we can get the fans back in Lovell, Lovell Edwards Stadium and we can entertain them. And uh, until then, we're going to try to do our best and, and, and try to make them happy while they – watch and hear us uh, you know, on, on TV and radio. We sure appreciate, appreciate you, Coach. Thanks for dealing with us at halftime, with changing our schedule around on you there, and then uh, for spending so much time with us post-game as well. We appreciate you. Greg Riley, you guys know I love you, man. Mitch, thank you guys for everything you do for BYU football. and Anything for you, Greg. Anything for the voice of the Cougars. So thanks, guys. Go Cougs. You are the man. Thanks, Kalani. Have a great week ahead. All right, that's uh, Coach Kalani Sitake. We will come back and hear from Cougar Nation on the program we call Cougar Nation Now. It is BYU Dining and BYU Creamery, Cougar Nation Now, and it is straight ahead. You can get in on Twitter already by using the uh, hashtag BYUCNN, hashtag BYUCNN. Cougar Nation Now is coming up on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to BYU Dining's Cougar Nation Now. BYU Dining, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Be part of the show by emailing your questions to CougarNationNow at BYU.edu or tweet your questions using the hashtag BYUCNN. Let's head live to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth and join Riley Nelson, Mitchell Jurgens, and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. All right, at some point, BYU is going to you know, maybe stop averaging 50-plus points per game. I hope it doesn't happen. might happen, Riley. But uh, here we are. BYU, through two games, is uh, averaging 51.5 points per game. 55 at Navy, 48 here tonight. And truly, literally, the only uh, red zone failures are when BYU decides to kneel down to end the game. When BYU wants to score, the Cougars have been scoring at a great clip. As we talked last year, uh, we talked about the challenge last year was to score touchdowns inside the 20. Well, of the 12 drives in which BYU's tried to score, they're at 75% touchdown rate inside the red zone. Nine touchdowns, three field goals when they get inside the 20. Again, taking away those two drives on which they kneel down. And so um, there, there, there is a real fix that we've already seen through two games. Now we have to, I guess, maybe note the fact that the schedule to begin last year is a little bit different than the schedule to begin this year. So you'd expect maybe a little more efficiency and proficiency. But that said, um, you know they're 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 playing clean when they get into position to, to to find the end zone. There are objective things that you can look for uh, when you're watching tape and when you're watching a team. And this team is doing all of those things. Last year there was flashes of it, but. Uh, but, I mean, as evidenced by USF and Toledo and, quite frankly, Hawaii. I mean, Hawaii was better than, I think, Toledo and USF. But, like, they, they were – while there were flashes of it against the Tennessees and USC's of the world, you also – it was counteracted by those. This this team is taking care of business. And I think that was something that Coach hit on in both his postgame press conference and his interview with us is that they've taken that step forward from a maturity standpoint and – I mean, i got to be honest with you, Greg. Like, you can only play the schedule that's in front of you. But, like, BYU is not a Sun Belt caliber team. You say there may not there may come a day when they don't average 50 points, but, I mean, if our schedule is largely made up of Sun Belt, which are the only, you know, ones, or at least were available up until this point, we'll see how the schedule shakes out for the rest of the season. 
40, 50 points a game is not out of the realm of possibilities, in my opinion. BYU 48 and Troy 7 at tonight's final score. Let's head to the social media, hashtag BYUCNN, hashtag BYUCNN. And at Chaplin Schumann gets us underway, noting after two games, he says, so impressed with the way Tyler Algier runs, breaking tackles, getting upfield. Your thoughts on how the running back position will play out the rest of the year? Well, we should, and thank you uh, for the question. We should note, Tyler didn't finish the game. Couldn't finish the game on the feet. He was uh, he was banged up and was iced up on the sideline. We hope it's nothing more than than you know the bumps and bruises, contusion variety, as opposed to something long term, longer term, because they really do need to stay, I think, healthy with their top two guys, Katoa and Algier. As exciting as Miles Davis appears to be in the backfield, you want those two to get you all the way. And Kalani talked about that. You want veterans back there carrying the football. I mean, if even if these are young guys that maybe look quicker or have a little bit more speed, you want guys who you can trust toting the rock. Look, uh, Mitch was down there on the sidelines. He was looking at it. He, he was the one that saw – Tyler never went into the tent, and he said he had ice on the outside of the knee. The reality is it's stuff on the outside of the knee, you don't have, you know, w- when you hurt things that really matter, it's not putting ice on the outside of the knee. There's a little bit more involved in that. So I I don't think there's any reason to assume that that was anything more than maybe he got scraped by a cleat or maybe he took a face mask there or something. And as Kalani said, at that point, the game was already in hand. So why, you know, put him back in there to have it get stiff enough, especially when, you know, a late game like this, there is, and, and sorry to get off on a little bit of a tangent here, but in, in talking with some of the BYU guys, sleep is so important to recovery, especially when you have one less day than your normal routine. So a game that goes into the early morning of the, where we sit today and then having to turn around again on Friday, it, why risk it with a guy like Tyler who, as was pointed out by, I can't remember the texter's name, but was pointed out by uh, the BYU Nation out there, by Cougar Nation, the game uh, it has been running so well or been having such a great season. Uh, you can get tangential whenever you want, Riley, on this program. <laughs> uh, we're going to combine a couple of tweets from Ben Burt into one question. He says, it was amazing to watch the D-line. Big credit to Tuiaki and the staff for having a completely different and appropriate game plan for Navy and for Troy. And he said he felt the key to the game was the endurance of both the defensive and the offensive lines. The D was able to handle the fast pace and take Troy out of their comfort zone, and that points to great preparation. And truly, you could say that uh, um, the, the trench battles have been decisive for BYU through games one and two. Most definitely they have a great point uh, to to the endurance. I think that had a lot to do with scheme. I think they helped themselves by putting pressure on Troy by getting them behind the sticks in the majority of uh, the drives, especially early in the game, and then not letting them. I, I think, look, when you watch them against Middle Tennessee, empty was a big portion of their package, and BYU effectively took the empty formation out of any kind of productive or any kind of thing because Troy was unwilling to adjust. And BYU, I think three out of their four sacks came when Troy lined up and empty. So great job by those guys staying in uh, condition, staying on the field, and great job by the coaches dialing up schemes that allowed them to be successful and to, as you pointed out earlier in the broadcast, have one of the more lopsided time of possession battles that there's been in quite some time. Almost a 30-minute differential. Uh, a, a tweet coming in addressed to me from at Elder Mars, and he asks the question, because I, I, I noted on social earlier, um, I, I noted the fact that BYU has scored in all eight quarters of this season, and his question to me was a touchdown in all eight, and the answer is yes. BYU hasn't just scored in every quarter. They've scored at least one touchdown in every quarter so far this season through eight quarters of play, so points are great, but touchdowns in every quarter is the kind of consistency BYU struggled to generate last season and as, as I noted in the in the tweet that I posted earlier when BYU scoring in every quarter BYU's winning almost every game BYU's done it 15 times under Kalani and they've won 13 of the 15 including all five times it's happened here at home you score in every quarter you're likely going to win the game and that's been the case in the Kalani Sitake era Mitchell Jurgens has rejoined us here in the booth and we made this point uh, earlier in the broadcast during a time in which Mitch was dealing with some equipment issues down on the sideline, so may or he may or may not have heard it and certainly was not able to respond to it. So we'll repeat that point before going to the break, and it was this. We had tonight Dax Milne with 140 receiving yards, and we had Gunnar Romney with 138 receiving yards. It is the first time that BYU's had two players with 100-plus receiving yards in the same game since 
2014 at Cal. Jordan Leslie, 155, and our man Mitch with a buck 07. And you were getting into the end zone that day. Yeah, snuck in there with 107. That was nice. Um, yeah, no, it, it's so fun to see. I mean, a, as a receiver, I, I love to see, you know, those those receivers just climb in the stat, you know, especially those yardage markers. Um, I mean, Zach was – he was so on point today. And, and you can tell that the connection that he's building with these receivers is – um, I mean, there's experience there, right? These are juniors. They've been playing since they were freshmen, and you can see the chemistry out there. And just so good to see that you know they're all they're stepping up, they're playing, um, they're they're making big plays when it counts. And then and one of the things that um, has been, I mean, I've noticed especially in the last two uh, the last two games is the yards after catch. These receivers, and, and not just after catch, but after contact. Um, they're making guys miss and getting another, you know, 20, 30 yards on these runs, um, which is just putting BYU in such great position to score and finish drives. And um, so, I mean, the receivers are stepping up. I uh, loved seeing what we saw out of um, Gunner and Dax today. Uh, excited to see what's what's to come with those guys. The Cal game, two touchdowns for you that day? Two, yeah. yeah. Two touchdowns. From Christian Stewart? Yep. Yeah, they were uh, Christian. I mean, he had was, was he not? Did he not pass for over four hundred that game, or was he close? Mm, I think the game we talked about in which he had four hundred was a loss to Nevada, which he he might have, he might have had four hundred plus in that game, but he had a higher game yeah. uh, in, in a loss to Nevada. But I'll double check on that one. Yeah, he's a uh, Christian Stewart man. Late late in that season, that so that was the last uh, regular season game before the bowl game. And um, I mean that was a that was a big win for us. I know Cal was they were actually on the verge of if they won they would have been bowl eligible, and so it was a very important game for Cal. And it, I mean it was fun to go go there, and and that game was back and forth and back and forth. And the defense actually came up with the big stop there on the final drive. They had a chance to score, and um, the defense came up big, and so. Awesome game all around. Fun to be a part of. Uh, 433 passing yards for Christian Stewart that day. Outpassing Jared Goff. Wow. Yep. Goff threw it 60 times that day for 393. So the two guys combined for over 800 passing yards. And the long pass play of the day from Christian Stewart was an 83-yard scoring toss to Jordan Leslie. But there was Mitchell Jurgens that day scoring from 47 yards out and scoring from nine yards out as BYU hung on for a wild one, 42 to 35. Yeah, it was a fun one. BYU had a fun one tonight in a different way, blowout way, but we'll take it. 48 to 7 is your final score. We're chatting about it on BYU Dining, BYU Creamery, Cougar Nation Now, hashtag BYUCNN on Twitter. We'll take more comments, more feedback from the fans right after this. So you can also email us, by the way, Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu. Cougar Nation Now, it's one long word, Cougar Nation Now at BYU.edu. More from the fans after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to Cougar Nation now on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Here's your host, the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. It was late night kick. It was around 8.20 Mountain Time when this game began, so it's 1 in the morning Mountain Time, and we're still rolling here. Let's pause 10 seconds, though, for a brief station identification on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is BYU Radio on KBYU FM HD2 Provo. You're listening to BYU Football on BYU Radio. BYU 48, Troy 7, our final score. Greg Grubel, Riley Nelson, Mitchell Jurgens, your broadcast trio. Uh, here's what happens when you work between a quarterback and a wide receiver during a commercial break. I go to break, and the quarterback, so before the last break, we talked with Mitchell about this game at Cal back in 2014 when he had 107 receiving yards and a couple of touchdowns. We go to break, and off the air, the quarterback to my left, Riley, what was your question for, for Mitch? Just what routes were they on? She says, remember what routes you ran? And Mitch, you said? Uh, 98 scissors and a 35 bow. <laughs> This game was six years ago. And, uh, yeah, of course, why would you not remember the routes you ran for yep. those two touchdowns? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so then they just basically uh, chopped it up during the entire break and uh, ran through the entire thing and uh, like it happened last night instead of six years ago. I love working with these guys. Um, this is BYU Dining and BYU Creamery. 
Cougar Nation now. Question coming in from uh, at Desorb Glasses. His name is Gregory Dean, we think, if that's his real name, and why would we doubt him, right? His question was, when was the last time that a BYU quarterback had two consecutive games with a quarterback rating over 200? He's, of course, referencing the fact that Zach has opened the season with two of those games. And I'm glad he asked it because we have the answer, right? We've said it a couple times tonight, but uh, just for this person and for those who may have missed it, the answer, Riley, do you remember who it was? Max Hall in 2008. Max Hall, 12 years ago, last guy to do it. And uh, Zach is off to a heck of a start to his junior season. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, so yards per catch – and t- and so that has a huge thing to do. So it is rare that we already mentioned that there was three completions over 40 yards. So there was 41, 57, and 70. There was a 37-yard completion. And then there was a ton kind of in that 15 to 25 range. Like we were getting plays in chunks. And we were talking about uh, – Mitch was talking before the break about the chemistry that it looks like Zach has been able to develop with these guys. I also want to give some credit to um, Coach Aaron Roderick, who is – I think more than in years past, been able to find ways to get these guys in one-on-one situations in space. You think about the 70-yarder, you think about, you know, gunners from last week. I just feel like these receivers, are, they're not catching the ball in traffic. They're not having to do too much work. They've, they've been able to architect plays, and Zach has been able to identify and deliver the ball in situations where, like the, like the play that Dax had, you know, he breaks one tackle and it's off to the races. And when you can have that luxury as an offense, now, let me say that I think a lot of that has to do – look, that's what I love about football. It's so multifaceted. A lot of that had to do with the fact that Troy felt like they had to commit seven and eight guys to the box, which meant that they had their DBs out on islands having to make open field one-on-one tackles. So it's all intertwined, and uh, the running backs are playing well. The O-line's playing well. The wide receivers, obviously, they have been they were the story of tonight. And then, of course, you got Zach, who has, who's really showing maturity into the second game of his third season as the starter. Uh, Navy did not get to Zach for any sacks tonight. Uh, Troy got to him twice, but BYU's allowed to get only two sacks uh, through two games. BYU conversely has sacked the opposing quarterback nine times, including five sacks of an option quarterback, which isn't normally done. Back to Riley's chunk play comment and the stat program that BYU uses or the stat program provider BYU uses has a definition of chunk plays, which is passing plays of 15 or more yards and rushing plays of seven or more yards. And of BYU's 11 chunk passing plays were nine of 20 yards or more. 23, 29, 37, 70, 52, 41, 24, 23, 22. Then you had seven rushing plays of 10 yards or more, a 10, an 11, an 11, an 11, a 17, and a couple of 19s uh, for BYU. So they were coming in big uh, swaths uh, on a night when BYU ran – accumulated a total of 664 total offense yards and that is a Kalani Sitake era high and uh, again with the with the schedule BYU's playing the opportunity may be there to have nights like this which brings us to the uh, uh, maybe the overarching question is it important that BYU not just win games but win games a certain way because of how the schedule has now been constructed Mitch you want to take that first yeah, absolutely. Um, I th- I think it's very – I mean, it depends on what the end goal is, right? And I think looking at the season, and we talked a little bit about this before uh, before the game started, um, with the shift in schedule, uh, the, almost the expectation of the goal there is, is, is an undefeated season, right? And it's hard to talk about that all the time, though, because from a football perspective – you can't say, hey, we're going to go undefeated and just think long term because you got to, I mean, it's a week to week preparation. You got to treat every single game as if it's, um, you know, the one game. You got to win one game at a time, right? Um, but with that said, I mean, with a lot of these voters, as far as, you know, getting into potential a New Year's Six Bowl, um, when, when they do wake up in the morning and they see, wow, BYU is continuing to make statements, they can go in and look at the box score, see the total yards that. BYU's putting up in addition to the yardage, you know, lack of yardage that we're giving up on the defensive side. I mean, that's take notice football. And I think, I mean, with with everything that's gone on with the, um, you know, I know some of these players are obviously, you know, wish that they could have kept the, the schedule that they had. But if they can put in the work, have statement wins like they're having right now where, you're, the the point uh, the victory of margin is so significant 
that when they get there to the end of the season and they have a chance to get into potentially a New Year's Six Bowl, I mean, that's going to make this whole journey worth it. And every single one of these statement wins, um, I think it can be very impactful. So, um, I mean, that's kind of my take on it. I don't know what you think, Riley. Well, I was just going to say, look, I th- it's now that the Pac-12 has decided to have some semblance of a season and the Big Ten is doing that as well. I mean, I was super excited after name. I'm like, guys, the Rose Bowl is the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, and they're not playing football, but they're going to still – I'm sure they're going to still want to have the Rose Bowl. They'll find a way to do that. Yeah, yeah, likewise with the Fiesta Bowl and the Orange Bowl. Well, now they're – you know, these guys are limping along and, and trying to come back in and be Johnny come lately to the party. So all the more reason that it's important that BYU show out against that schedule and also – and I know he's working on it, but also all the more importance for Tom Homo – to add some games. I I don't know. I didn't actually listen to the press conference, but I did see on Twitter, but the Mountain West commissioners left the possibility open for out-of-conference games, right? If it, the reason why I pointed that one is Boise would be a great one to sneak on the schedule late in the game. Is Am I right or wrong on that? Did any of you guys get that? Yeah, no, that? The, the Boise game was mentioned in particular, and I thought there was also an allusion or a reference to Utah State yeah. having the ability to do the same. If the teams are given the flexibility to play one out-of-league game, um, you know, Utah State and Boise were teams that had BYU on the schedule. They're close travel games. They could drive if they wanted. I mean, these are all things that come into play, and so those might be two games you can add. I think you know, when, the Nate, when the Army game got postponed, um, the, the question was, well, why doesn't Army just immediately reschedule? We all know there's a date. Why not just get that thing done? I think Army was waiting to see a little bit how their season went. The fact that their undefeated season ended after two games might make it more likely that they actually engage BYU in a discussion to, to get that game back on the schedule. If, if Army had, say, beaten Cincinnati, which is a ranked team, gotten on a roll and kept going, well, then suddenly BYU would have been more of a threat to their undefeated season. Now that part's off by the wayside already. Uh, maybe a little more incentive to go ahead and, and, and explore it. But all that being said, Tom's now trying to fill dates that might already be filled with teams regionally that now have the ability to do so. So either way, I don't think BYU is going to stay at eight games. I'd like to, to, to see, see at least get the double digits, and I think that's a possibility now. It's imperative that they get some higher-profile names on the schedule, if at all possible, because if BYU should were to keep winning games, the discussion would come up, and like it always does with any team that, finds itself undefeated out of a non-Power 5 conference is, well, who have they played? And in this case, it's a little different because things were taken out of BYU's hands. They had six P5s ready to go. This was a strong schedule until COVID hit. And ironically, all the teams that bailed belong to leagues that are now playing again. They're just not playing BYU. The schedule was taken away. It was never returned and restored to its original strength. So BYU's had to do what it can. And I think people and observers will realize the position BYU was put in, all that said, if there's a bigger name out there you can put on the schedule, it behooves BYU to, to get that game. And Boise is a great example of the kind of team that, that, that would give you some heft. In general, we we bifurcate uh, the FBS between P5 and G5, but within the G5 there are there's also another tier, right, in that Sunbelt is not Mountain West, is not Confer- – so UCF, right, two years ago played right. LSU in the Fiesta Bowl. Boise's played in P5 Bowls. TCU back when they were in the Mountain West. Utah, Mountain West. So you've had Mountain West. You've had – is UCF uh, American Conference, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. so uh, the Mountain West and American, Houston's an, an American Conference, right? They're obviously – uh, uh, now, not to say that Sun Belt teams aren't good teams, but there's obviously the upper level G5 and then the lower level G5. And so, to the point about wh- what does it have to look like if the winner of the Sun Belt, which that were largely a Sun Belt schedule, is not playing in a New Year's Six Bowl? Hence, the imperative, as you just laid out, Greg, to try and get a couple more of those Mountain West American Conference caliber programs in there, and then you got to beat them. Right. But, but this uh, is all you, contingent on you on just winning. don't lose games. Yeah, right. exactly. And and and, and the, the next, you know, the La Tech will be a challenge. There's no doubt about that. They they are good. Uh, the game at Houston looms larger because it's a true road game. The only true road game BYU's got on the schedule now is the one at Houston. Right. And you wonder, you know, will Houston actually get the game they have scheduled to play before BYU comes to town? So the opportunities are, are few, at least to make um, the kind of noise that, that, that um, you know, that, that the true opinion makers will respect. But that said, if you're, I mean, Boise faced a lot of the same type of challenges for a lot of years, and they would just look so good in doing it and win by such large margins. They, they 
they were the real deal to everybody that really cared. And, and they always had the one non-conference game that they, they were able to get one early and do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, and kind of same opportunity here for BYU, right? Play the schedule that they got. Try and hope to get one of those upper caliber G5. I think P5 at this point, well, I don't think. G, P5 at this point is out of the question because all of them are playing uh, conference-only schedules. So get an upper-level G5 that has the respect of the vote, and then you beat them, and then that seems to be the Boise model for sneaking in backdoor to a New Year's Six. Uh, before the break, question coming in via the email, Cougar Nation now at byu.edu. It came in from Stephen Vincent, who said, how does your job as an announcer, or we could say announcers, change when a broadca- when broadcasting a game with no fans? And I'll, I'll give my impression of it, and then you guys can weigh in on, on either side of me. Uh, you know, when, when the ball is snapped or the ball is in the air or the teams are lining up, you, you really don't notice anything but the play. And, and where I notice it most, and maybe, where, maybe the only time I notice it, is where you would like to lay out and let the crowd kind of carry you uh, through um, some of the airspace after a big play or certainly a touchdown. That part's not there, um, and and that's kind of the um, you know the exclamation point on most any you know great play call is the is is the energy of the crowd that swells once you've described the scoring play, and and that has not been happening. And even when BYU goes on the road, we could still expect the swell. Because BYU fans are always heard. So whether it's home or road, that's the part we don't have is the ability to um, let the fans take over the broadcast for a time and and, and put a stamp of, of approval on the play we just witnessed. That's the biggest thing for me. Riley, how about you and then Mitch? Yeah, the biggest thing for me, and i am obviously been doing this uh, the for the shortest amount of time between uh, the three of you guys, but the biggest thing for me is just try and bring the energy in my voice because when you got the crowd piped into your ear, you naturally – bring more energy or you elevate it or things like that. People, look, we're not broadcasting over NPR. People aren't tuning in to listen to, you know, some podcast uh, to uh, of podcast description of a football game. People want to, the game day experience. And so that's been the, just the biggest thing is to have my own voice and energy and raise that appropriate to the play on the field mm. when normally it just kind of happens naturally as a byproduct to the crowd noise that I get in my ear or we don't have an open, open booth here at Lavelle Edwards, but a lot of stadiums, there's an open booth that we feel. Yeah, for me, it's actually it's it's pretty interesting because you know I've done this obviously two seasons prior, and and up to this point, I never really I didn't realize that I mean you if you're down there on a football game, you're not hearing personal conversations between players or coaches, and as I kind of walk back and forth, I can hear everything, right? <laughs> and so before, I mean, I I would. Um, when I've got my headset on, I can't hear too much crowd noise because you know I'm hearing us in the broadcast. Um, but it's kind of fun to just take one ear out, and I get uh, obviously can continue to hear the broadcast, but pick up on some of these personal conversations, whatever it's about, right? Football, life. Uh, I kind of get a little <laughs> bit of everything, which is fun. Um, and then one other thing, which I didn't realize, so <laughs> they they still have one of the the effects that they still have in, uh, here at Lavelle Edwards Stadium is the cannon in the northeast corner of the end zone that thing is so much louder with Without no the fans <laughs> there was every single time we scored in the northeast or in the north end zone i you know i i follow the ball wherever they go and so i'm down here and without, uh, I mean, without question, that cannon would go off. It would catch me by surprise every time. I would jump, you know, get startled, <laughs> and it's so much louder without fans. Because I went back and I was like, for my two years, I never really jumped when the cannon went off, and I realized the crowd kind of drowned out that noise a little bit. And yeah. and so, uh, anyway, some it, it's fun. I mean, it's uh, obviously watching some of these games earlier today. You see some fans. You know, down in the south, they've got 25% capacity, and it does get me excited to have um, the fans back in the stadium because there's there's an energy that you really just can't produce um, there on the field without them. Um, but uh, it is it, it's been a kind of unique experience. Your your position uh, down on the field in the team area or around the team area has made it such that um, you have had to do something Riley and I have not had to do, and that is get cleared. Yep. Uh, through COVID testing, uh, Kalani talks uh, how how you know he 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 is always um, you know curious and and wondering how they're going to get through you know what what the week will show when it comes to testing, and because of your proximity to them, um, you have to be in a, in a similar protocol. So you you were tested this past week. Yep, twice a week. So we test twice a week, and 
fortunately the test came back negative, so I could, that's why I you're could here be today. part of the experience. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and by the that's way, I have, be... no, I have no backup plan. By the way, I have no backup plan whatsoever. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, what, <laughs> hey Greg, if this test comes back positive, what's uh, what's the plan B? So, um, anyway, but yeah, we test twice a week, every home game. It's going to be that type of protocol, and um, you know, uh, love to see everyone taking safety precautions just to keep the health of the players and health of the coaches is most important. So, um, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a unique process. And hopefully I continue to test negative. So. And, and hopefully this is the last season we have to worry exactly. about this. All right, hashtag BYUCNN. If you want to tweet at us for Cougar Nation now, hashtag BYUCNN. You can also email us, CougarNationNow at BYU.edu. We will take a break. We'll come back. We'll get you a skill testing trivia question for two half gallons of famous BYU Creamery ice cream. This is the BYU Dining and BYU Creamery Cougar Nation Now program, BYU 48 and Troy 7. Our final score tonight on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Cougar Nation now on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. All right, so welcome back to BYU Dining, BYU Creamery, Cougar Nation now, hashtag BYUCNN on Twitter. And you can also use the email, as people uh, as people do, uh, week to week, Cougar Nation now at BYU.edu. Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson, along with Mitchell Jurgens up here in the booth. And... Uh, uh, by the way, since we last mentioned that uh, I have no backup plan for you, should you test positive? Do you have volunteers? Have it, have it for, yeah, already. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, my, my, my good buddy and former intern and current uh, Salt Lake City sports radio superstar, Jake Hatch, has, uh, has, has volunteered. So uh, awesome. he, 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 said, he said he'll, he'll be the guy. So uh, he, he will get an audition at the very least, I, th- I think, at this point. So 48-7 uh, to 7 is our final score, BYU over Troy. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, at Cougar Stats has tweeted in something interesting. BYU's scoring margin after their first two games is plus 93. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, 103 to 10. The only season with a larger margin after the first two games was 1977 when BYU outscored the opposition 104 to 6 in the first two games for a plus 98. So uh, BYU has a nearly historical scoring margin in games one and two of the season. Thanks to uh, Cougar Stats for that. Uh, Chaplain Schumann, by the way, has, re, uh, has re-entered uh, the chat to uh, ask you, Riley Nelson, how you are feeling in your second year in the booth, question mark. He notes, uh, from a listener perspective, you're doing a fine job, and I will also endorse that as well. And he says you have to be feeling pretty good that you're one of the chosen few who actually gets to be at the game. Yes, no, that's definitely I tickled pink and feeling more and more comfortable with it. Like, for example, if just a, a little moment of candor with the listeners out there, like I felt I got tongue tied two or three times earlier in the broadcast, once in the pregame and two early on in the first quarter, but kind of settled into a rhythm and and uh, found it there. So I was still finding my way, still trying to, you know, listen back to myself, make sure that my cadence is good, make sure that my content is good and all of those things. But ha- I, honestly, happy for the opportunity. Glad you guys keep inviting me back so I can get better each week. <laughs> and uh, that's the name of the game, just like you were when you were a player. All right, uh, and thanks for the comment uh, at Chaplain Schumann. And, uh, yeah, we're blessed to have Riley. I'm blessed to have both Riley and Mitch working with me. Uh, Zach Wilson tonight came eight yards short of 400 passing yards for the game. And here we now have, leading into the uh, skill testing trivia question from BYU Creamery, is your opportunity to win two half gallons of famous Creamery ice cream. And you can tweet at Greg Rubel. You can tweet using the hashtag BYUCNN. You can email Cougar Nation now at BYU.edu. However you choose to contact us, we will do our best to determine who was first in with the correct answer to give away the ice cream. We do our best. Usually we're right about who's first. And here's tonight's question. Zach Wilson did not get to 400 yards passing. Who is the last BYU quarterback to have a 400-yard passing game? That is your question. The first correct answer wins two half gallons of famous Creamery ice cream. Who's the last BYU quarterback to have a 400-yard passing game? The correct answer wins ice cream. Next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. 
Entering the 1996 postseason, the BYU football team was ranked fifth in the national polls with just a single loss blighting their otherwise perfect record. With over 71,000 fans in attendance, on New Year's Day 1997, the Cougars took on the 14th ranked Kansas State Wildcats in the Cotton Bowl Classic. Down 15 to five in the fourth quarter, the Cougars needed a miracle comeback to secure a Cotton Bowl victory. Huge play here, 3.45 to go. The protection is for Kayla Louie, touchdown. No flags. BYU on top. There he is, KO, with what could be the KO punch against the Wildcats of Kansas State, 339 to play. Have a BYU has regained the lead. The Cougars held on to win 19 to 15, finishing the season with the longest win streak in the nation. And that was another Cougar Classic moment here on BYU Radio. Let's get you back to Cougar Nation now on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Hey, special shout out to Kavika Fonua. Kavika ends up with two tackles and a pass breakup. And he also rushes seven times for 27 yards. <laughs> Kavika going both ways. So BYU's got these, uh, these, these specialty backs that go from linebacker to running back like it's no big deal. Tyler Algier. Uh, was a running back to begin last season. He ended up rushing. Uh, he ended up being a running back for three games. He's now one of the main running backs for BYU. We hope he uh, recovers well in time for the La Tech game. And then you have Kavika Fonua doing what uh, Kavika did tonight. All right, uh, we congratulate Dallin Hickson at Dallin Hickson on Twitter for being the first person to respond correctly with an answer to tonight's skill testing trivia question. The question was, who was the last BYU quarterback to have a 400-yard passing game because Zach Wilson came eight yards shy of that, and we actually discussed this quarterback and this game earlier in this program, meaning, Mitch, that the answer to the question is? Christian Stewart. Christian Stewart, who had 433 passing yards in that memorable win at Cal when he outdueled Gerald, uh, Jared Goff and found that our, day he was Gerald. <laughs> he, he was not Jared. He, he was, was he Gerald. was the, he was the brother Gerald. Yeah. Uh, on that day when he uh, he uh, outdueled Jared Goff and uh, found our man Mitch for two touchdown passes on a 107 yard receiving day for Mitch and a 155 yard receiving day for Jordan Leslie. The last time that BYU had two century mark receivers in the same game until tonight. When BYU had Gunnar Romney and uh, Dax Milne turn the trick. Gunnar at buck 38 and Dax at 140. So all these things coming full circle. And we congratulate Dallin Hickson for being first in with the correct response. Uh, Dallin, I will get with you on the social media. I'll probably end up DMing you and asking you for details. You'll get those to us, and we'll get two half gallons of famous creamery ice cream to you as soon as possible. And we thank all those who contributed correct answers and incorrect answers uh, in tonight's Inside Scoop trivia question brought to you by the BYU Creamery and BYU Dining. The BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. That is our Inside Scoop trivia feature, which brings us to the end of our broadcasting day. Wow. It is 1.30 in the morning mountain daylight time, and we've got to say good night and good morning until next Friday night when the Louisiana Tech Bulldogs out of Ruston, Louisiana, will be uh, coming to town and uh, in the uh, in the cutout section across the stands from us here at the stadium, uh, among the cutouts in the stands, one belonging to Carl Malone, Louisiana Tech alum. Hey, you guys know the mascot? Bulldogs. Yes, very good. And uh, and Riley notes during the break off the air that Louisiana Tech also has a quarterback in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and that would be Terry Bradshaw. Got to share a little personal tidbit before we sign off. Freshman year, Utah State. I know the pre, we don't want to acknowledge the pre-BYU career. No, it's part of your life. That was uh, that was my uh, – we went down there. We couldn't stop them. We lost 49 to 35. But of the 35, that was like my breakout game as a freshman. Um, I First time I ever rushed for – I threw for 300, rushed for 100. In fact, I think it was like my only college career when I did that. Really? It, we, it was like a backdoor. <laughs> like when I say it was 30, it was, it was 49, 35. <laughs> like it wasn't that close, but they let me stay in there, and I racked up some yards and some. But uh, so I've been down there in Ruston, Louisiana, and uh, played in front of 
played down there in the deep south. But um, it's uh, first ever meeting for BYU. I think you said that earlier, yeah. Greg. What was your first Utah State home win? Was it Fresno, Fresno State? State? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, that was really the coming out party. But like, my numbers weren't great. I th- we threw the ball for like twenty times for like a hundred and seventy something yards. That uh, me being a guy who's all about the numbers, you know, <laughs> as all of us quarterbacks are. No, that Le- that Louisiana Tech one stands out a little bit because three hundred one hundred was a pretty big thing as a yeah. true freshman. Um, did that? I I never did that here at BYU. In fact, yeah. I don't ever. I had one hundred yard. Here's. Sorry, this is turning into the Riley Nelson trivia hour. I had one hundred yard game. Do you do you guys know what it was? Gosh. Greg wouldn't you wouldn't have ever guessed Mitch. Greg, would you know? Uh San Jose State. I played I know, I only played one quarter of this game. It was actually Wyoming in garbage duty in two thousand nine. And I rushed for a hunt. C- 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 in the a- quarter? Coach and I. Coach and I just kept calling draw after draw after draw after draw. <laughs> <laughs> You, you said this was a quarter's worth of work. I think so. Yeah, I was. I th- I think I was like 102 yards or something like that. We'll have to. Well, do you I, have it? You know, I'm going to check it. Uh, it was the 52 nothing game. Yeah. Uh, you did not attempt. Uh, by the way, Max no. Hall. Max Hall was a, a a subpar 20 for 22 passing. Yeah. He was 20 for 22 passing for 312 yards and a pass efficiency of 270. Four TDs. Of 270. Hey, can I tell you about this, by the way? Max? In, I, Max probably isn't listening. Oh, I was By the 100. way, what a oh, letdown. Okay. You only ran for 71, 71 yards in one quarter of work. Okay. But a touchdown. Yeah, there you go. No, we just I just remember draw after draw after draw. Anyway, so Max, so I remember that year. He used to, early on in the season... <laughs> this is only the, the the listeners that stay with us till one thirty three are the only ones who get this kind of insider knowledge. Um, early on in the season, we were handing off to Harv because we still had Harv, and we were trying to get Harv some TDs, trying to get him some recognition and stuff. I think we were playing like uh, it was like Air Force or Colorado State it was one of those Colorado teams, and we got down against the goal line and we handed it off to Harv and Manasseh. They both had a couple of touchdowns. Or How whatever. does Colorado State sound? Would that be maybe accurate? Uh, it could have been because bo- bo- it was early in the year, and it's the only Colorado team you had on the schedule. Bottom line is we were beating them, but okay. so we get in the we get in the quarterback room on Monday, and like you know, we watch the film, and Max is like, "Hey, I gotta say this. I just gotta get this off my chest." I'm like, "We can't run it every time, Dan. We gotta do some play actions because I deserve those two. If if we pass it all the way down, we gotta play action throw it to Dennis or George or Dennis or Andrew George. <laughs> anyway, so I remember that Wyoming game was won because I don't did Harvey. Oh, you're you're. No, off I, I, Went back to the CSU game where Harvey anyway, ran it a ton for three touchdowns. Yeah, yes. and I think I just remember being down like inside the five or the ten a couple times in that Wyoming game, and us running uh, play action so that Max could get his passing TDs because he had four that game. And I don't think did we have. Yeah, see, Harv had zero TDs. <laughs> like all the, and both these, uh, the Brian TD and my TD were in garbage time when we got into the fourth quarter. Brian Korea, shout out to Brian Korea out there in Oklahoma. But anyway. There's there's the inside nuggets of info that only us uh, night owls get, and and so and so that's why you see uh, Manasseh Tonga getting a two yard touchdown pass from Max Hall. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you go throughout if you go throughout that 2009 season, which by the way, I remind I it's funny I rem, I um, so in t- fast forward 2012 right, and I remembered that from when Max Doman, of course, was a quarterbacks coach. He was my coach in 2012, and Jamal, I think that. That was in 2012. His freshman year, that was like his the most touchdowns he had, or 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 up there. Something it was like second. He, he was a touchdown machine. It was because he was so good around the goal line. He scored from outside a, a little bit, but um, you're talking he, Jamal now. J- Jamal Williams is a true freshman. He had 12 he, touchdowns 12, as a freshman. And keep in mind, he didn't even play until the fourth game, the fourth or the fifth game. So he had 12 touchdowns in eight or nine games. And in I, eight starts. Yeah, eight starts. eight starts. So there you go. 12 touchdowns and eight starts. And that that same year, I, and I, it was so funny because I was so glad because I was nervous saying it. We watched film, and it was one where I think it was like Oregon State or something like that. Jamal had two or three touchdowns down by the goal line. And I said to Coach Jones, I was like, I just basically recreated what Max did. I was like, hey, I got to get something off my chest. <laughs> we can't keep handing the ball off to Jamal. We need to throw some play actions down there. <laughs> Luckily, he remembered. Doman was like, hey, Max. Get down to the locker room, get dressed, and get out to practice. Yeah. So he, luckily he remembered the whole thing. But a little bit of insight in the I QB it. room from 2009-2012. You stay up late. That's what you get. 
with us here at 136. By the, the way, morning. if this gets back to, back to Max, which in today's world it most likely will, <laughs> that dude deserved every single touchdown stat that he did that that he got. He earned them all, 94 of them or whatever it is. The all-time leader. Now he occupies a special plate uh, place in the in the heart of uh, every Cougar fan, um, and an incomparable winner at BYU was Max Hall. All right, let's uh, let's do wrap it up. Uh, we're going to thank our crew back at BYU Radio. Our control board operators, Cole Wissinger and Liam Howard, our engineers, Barry Squires and Sean Fay, our studio host, Jason Shepard, our coordinating producer, Terry South, our broadcast intern, Caleb Lemming. That is our crew back at uh, BYU Radio. Great work tonight by, by those guys. Uh, here in the booth, our spotter slash broadcast intern and engineering assistant is and was Andrew Gray. Our engineer, Michael Wimmer. And, you know, the question we got about what's it like to broadcast a game without fans in the stands, Michael uh, has to adjust how he, um, you know, deals with things without the crowd noise to turn to, and he does a great job making it still feel like there's something going on, some kind of buzz in the air. And so Michael Wimmer is our engineer. And uh, our thanks to the BYU Sports Information Media Relations crew, Jenny Wheeler, Duff Tittle, uh, Kenny Cox, Kyle Chilton, uh, Brett Pine, all those folks. So much help uh, from BYU's athletics and social media and marketing folks uh, that uh, uh, have something to do with what we do, and hopefully it sounds good to all of you out there. And uh, then you get the, the guys with the headsets on, and that would be the man to my left. Riley Nelson. And the man to my right. Mitchell Jurgens. Here we are, crossing fingers for two more negative tests for Mitchell next week, so we can be back on the air with us next Friday night. <laughs> Not to mention a bevy of negative tests for all the staff and players in BYU. Yes, we, negative so, is positive. We want as much negativity as possible this next week. Tomorrow's my first test, so cross your fingers for tomorrow. Okay, and let's, let, let's hope you're on a roll <laughs> this week. Um, so for all the aforementioned, uh, my name is uh, Greg Rubel. Thanking you for tuning in telling you that our next game will come your way in six nights. It'll be Friday night, BYU and Louisiana Tech. I think we're on, I think it's a 5 o'clock pregame and a 7 o'clock kick. 7 o'clock kick. For the Cougars and the Bulldogs here at an empty Lovett Lever Stadium. But, hey, BYU got through tonight in, uh, in fine fashion without fans in the stands. Hopefully they can uh, do it again next week. Keep all the seats warm for you all as you join us at some point here at the home of the Cougars. So for everybody, my name is Greg Rubel saying in the meantime and in between time, BYU's a winner tonight, 48-7 over the Trojans of Troy, and you heard it all right here on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Good night and so long from Provo.